parents. Passover, the holy day of celebration and remembrance of how God had delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. For centuries, the Jewish people had celebrated that when Jesus went there at 12 years old. And they continue to celebrate that to this day. Passover. It's all about this idea and truth that God was going to deliver his people from Pharaoh. You can read in Exodus about all the plagues that he brought upon Pharaoh and the Egyptian people. The final plague, though, was the one that finally broke the will of Pharaoh. God told Moses, I'm going to send my death angel, and he's going to pass through the nation of Egypt, and he's going to take the life of the firstborn of every family. But for my people, fear not, God told Moses. I want you to instruct every family to take a lamb and kill it, a sacrifice of sorts, and take the blood from the lamb and put it over the doorpost or the door frames of, the, of your homes, every Jewish family. And when I pass through Egypt to take the firstborn of Egypt, I will pass over <laughs> oh, the homes of those that have the blood applied Amen. to the door frames. Right. So Mary and Joseph, when Jesus is 12, they go to the Passover to remember the blood of the Lamb not understanding that their son would be the lamb that would take away the sins of the world. And I believe that as Jesus went, especially at 12 years old, he was aware that he is because he's present tense. Present tense. When he said, I am, it means he always has been and always will be. But I believe he understood at 12 years old that he was and is the Lamb of God given to free us from sin and the slavery and bondage of sin. On the trip home, they traveled for about a day and that evening Mary and Joseph are saying, where's Jesus? And they they look among the caravan of sorts to, to find him among their family, uh, amongst their family, and they can't find Jesus. And they're, they're in a panic, and they, they go back into Jerusalem looking for him. And after three days, they found him. And I want to read the scripture. This is one of the passages that's part of this foundation, the series God is uh, working through. We're working through with God's leading uh, this time. It's Luke 2. It's on the screen, I think. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking him questions. Everyone who heard Jesus was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said, I I'd like to back up. I think the, the word made is not astonished. They were aggravated. <laughs> Their son is missing. And Jesus said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your dad and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, Jesus asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house that I must be about my father's business? I think he knew at 12 years old. He, he, he knew who he was, beginning with the fact that he was the son of Father God, creator of all humanity, and his relationship with his father, even at 12, was the very essence of his life. The hub, if I may. The foundation. The meaning for his life was found in his father. And that is what God the Father desires in our lives. He wants us to live our lives from a viewpoint and a relationship of the Father and the Son. He tells us that in Matthew 6. 
So we got Jesus is 12 years old saying, didn't you know I must be in my father's house about my father's business? And then we, get, we, we hear Jesus in his adult ministry, if I may, on his way to the cross. Seek. Well, let me go back. Let's get the first part first. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans, those who knew, don't know God, have nothing to do with God, those who don't know Father God, are after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. That's what living in the Father's house or life in the Father's house looks like. This intimate relationship. Jesus is telling us your relationship with the Father through me, let it define your life. So these two passages of Scripture, why wow, they show us what life in the Father's house looks like. It's the truth that fulfillment in life a rock and roll group wanted to sing the song. I think it was the Rolling Stones. You know, it's kind of funny. All these rock and roll bands, this is an ADHD moment. Some of them about 80 years old, acting like they were when they were 20. The Rolling Stones are now rolling in their wheelchairs. <laughs> well, that's another story. <laughs> it's the truth. that fulfillment in life, no matter what age you are. And life everlasting is found only in the Father and His Son. That relationship with Him. And God is saying, let it be first and foremost. Last week we looked at how life, this kind of life is the simplest four words. Being, business, become, becoming, and blessings. When we seek first the kingdom of God, by God's grace, because we can't do anything apart from the cross and God's spirit working through the power of the cross and the resurrected Christ. That being in relationship with the Father is where it begins and must define the essence of our life. And his business, his kingdom business, it must be prevalent even as we go about our business and become the, the words to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, becoming holy by the power of God's Spirit, becoming like Jesus and the Father on this journey. And how that brings the blessings that, oh, how can we ever talk about the blessings of God? I think there's two words today that point us to what living in the Father's house looks like. This idea that we're called to seek first and that as we live our lives, we're about the business of the Father and His Son. I think there's two words. These two words lead us to what God wants to say, I think, today in this message. He's already said it to me, and He's saying it to me. And now He wants to say it to you two simple words for the message title and theme today. Be aware. Let's stand, if you would, please, for the reading of the word. We're using Matthew 6, 31, 33 through 33 again. In the passage we read last week, do not worry. Now, these words are in red because Jesus said them. Do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And then John 14, one of my favorite passages, all these scriptures. You know, you have to name a favorite scripture, I mean, there's so many of them. John 14, Jesus again, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms, mansions. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? 
And Jesus answered, I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you will know. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. For now on, you do know him, and you've seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus said, fill up. Don't you know me? Even after I had been among you such a long time, anyone would say me has seen the Father. Philip, how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? In the words I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority. Brethren, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very, very truly I tell you. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Kyle Britt, will you pray for the reading of the word that God's Spirit will, will apply to our hearts, and that people will hear God speaking through his servant. Thank you. Lord, I thank you for this group that's gathered together here to worship you. And Lord, I know that you've heard all the prayer requests that you brought forth. And thank you that we serve God who makes us pray. Mm -hmm. As we open up our word, your word, Lord, we pray that we use our basket and we'll speak for him and bring message for each one. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Kyle. You may be seated. You know, Wikipedia defines the word awareness like this. Awareness is the ability to directly know and perceive, to feel, or to be cognizant of events. More broadly, it is a state of being conscious of something or someone. Jesus has given us the insight and by the power of the Holy Spirit, the ability to know the Father. Someone, a little girl, I've said this before, one, a little girl once stated this, Jesus is the best picture God ever took. Jesus says, Philip, the Father, our one. Now, in the mystery of the Trinity, we can't fully explain how God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are one. Because if we could explain it, we'd be God. And so there's a place where we try to, to understand uh, who they are, the personalities of the, the triune God, and, and the persons of the triune God. Our brains kind of go on overload. But Jesus came to die on the cross. Let me back up. He came to live this life. He experienced life like you and me, and then he went to the cross as a sinless sacrifice and died to reunite us with the Father, and he sealed it with his resurrection. He made the way for us to know the Father through the cross and through the empty grave. And because of that, we can be and live and be aware of the peace of the Father. Boy, I tell you, we're living in a world right now and peace is scarce. And I'm reminded of something Jesus said. Peace I give you, not as the world gives. This peace begins with salvation. The peace of the Father begins at the intersection of God's grace and our faith, trust. We know that by any number of words. Somebody will tell you I've been saved. I think of something funny. My, my wife didn't grow up in a, uh, a devout Christian home, a uh, home of faith. She has good parents. Um, but she wasn't in church for a lot of her life. And she met uh, my roommate uh, in college. And when they moved in the first weekend, right, my roommate's father had just met Lori. And he, he, was, he was kind of stoic, a nice guy, but a little stoic. And one of the first things he said to Lori is, are you saved? And she thought to herself, saved from what? <laughs> That's a 
term we use to come to know Christ. And the other terms we, we hear, Jesus said you must be born again. And so then we must be converted to faith in the Father through Jesus Christ. And so peace comes into our lives. We become aware of it when we understand that the cross, God's gift of salvation in the person of His Son who died on that cross, came to take our sinful hand and unite us to the Holy God. And if we come and we say we're sinners and we ask forgiveness and He forgives us and we have peace with God, Because all the sins have been washed away. And there's no boundaries in all of me to come back. Boundaries not the word. Yeah, boundaries is a good word, but a better word. There's nothing between us and God anymore. We're at peace with Him. We know the peace of the Father. And that's where it begins. We can understand I was once lost and sin was weighing me down. And I carried this guilt and conviction in my life. And now I'm free as a bird. I feel, feel like if I can fly away. Well, don't try that from a 20-story building now. But it's this truth that peace comes. Peace like a river attended my soul. That happens when we fall before the living God, our Father in heaven, and we say, please, by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, your Son, forgive me. Move into my heart. I want to know you, Father. And peace. And we can sing that song, It is well in my soul. Yes. But folks, that's the jumping in place of peace. Where by grace we become a of peace. But what about going forward as we live in relationship with the Father and Son? What about the daily, moment by moment times? This is the truth. By grace, in daily and moment by moment faith, we can live by the Holy Spirit's leading. We can be aware of the Father's peace even as we're facing all the junk of life. That's what Jesus is saying to us when he says, do not worry. Do not worry, he said. What you going to eat? What you going to drink? What you going to wear? For the pagans run after all these things. But your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the Father's kingdom. And his righteousness, all these things will be given to you as well. You know, I'm guilty of it. I'm not with you. We come to God and, and we say, save my soul. And he does it because of Jesus. And peace comes in. And we're no longer enemies of God. We're on his side and his friends. And it happens by simple faith and trust in his great, amazing grace. But when we walk with him, we often do not have peace. Because we don't trust him. I'm amazed that a lot of us believers, and a lot I've seen the past 19 years as a pastor, uh, they get saved by grace and faith, but the Bible says the just will what? And the reason we don't have peace is because we somehow get all uh, sophisticated on our journey with the Lord. And, and, and the awareness of the peace of the Father that we have in salvation, we don't allow Him to apply that peace in our daily lives. I think it's because we, we get our eyes on, on, on three. Not God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Us three. Me, myself, and I. A lot of times I make statements about I'm preaching to me. If you get anything out of it, that's good. Uh, I am a firm believer in something Neil Wiseman, Dr. Neil Wiseman, who's passed on, taught me in Bible college about 20 years ago. If the truth of the message doesn't move you, it won't move them. Well, this message has moved me this week. And I'm passing on. 
You know what I was thinking about, what God was showing me this week? The absence of peace is often connected to an awareness shift from the Father to me. Oh, I read something that Oswald Chambers wrote this week. Uh, he, Oswald Chambers didn't write this week. <laughs> He's been dead since 1923, I think. Just so you know, Oswald Chambers is not Jesus. But he sure did write some stuff anointed by the Holy Spirit that come from the heart of Jesus. He died at 43 years old of appendicitis in Egypt during World War I. He only wrote one book, but his wife, a court stenographer, would go to his, when he preached and he lectured, and she took notes, and she put together, by the leading of God, probably the, the devotional book that sold more than any in history. My utmost for his highest. And this, this, this week, as I was alone with God, I opened that up. God was nudging me. And he began to talk to me about how aware, the awareness shift can happen in our lives. Listen to what Chambers says. Self-awareness is the title. God intends for us to live a well-rounded life in Christ Jesus. But there are times when that life is attacked from the outside. In other words, the pressures and the burdens. Then we tend to fall back into self-examination, a habit that we thought was gone. Self-awareness is the first thing that will upset the completeness of our life in God. And self-awareness continually produces a sense of struggle and turmoil in our lives. Self-awareness is not sin, and it can be produced by nervous emotions or by suddenly being dropped into a totally new set of circumstances. Yet... It is never God's will that we should be anything less than absolutely complete in Him. Anything that disturbs our rest or peace in Him must be rectified at once, and it is not rectified by being ignored, but only by coming to Jesus Christ. If we will come to Him, asking Him to produce Christ's awareness in us, He will always do it until we fully learn to abide in Him. You know what? I preached last Sunday, and the enemy beat me up all afternoon into Monday. You guys were so quiet. And then I got a text from, from, from a dear follower of Christ that said, Hey, you're on the right path. Thank you, pretty much. I'm paraphrasing. So you know what? I've been a pastor 19 years. 21 years ago tomorrow, my wife and my precious daughter, Erin, and our miniature poodle, got in a U-Haul truck with everything we owned and headed to Colorado Springs to prepare for ministry 21 years ago. I love you guys. I love the people of Charlottesville, but that love will always be secondary to what I am called to do, and that's tell you what Jesus said. Some of you don't have peace because you're too focused, too focused on yourself. Amen. That's the truth. And the Lord even said this to me. Maybe rightly, Bill, you, 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 you're, you're, you're aware of some things in your life. Uh, you're aware that you have nervousness and you battle depression. Or you're aware of this aspect of maybe somebody's life, a leader. Or maybe, maybe uh, you're self-aware, Bill. Jesus said it clearly. Seek first the kingdom. He said it clearly. If you are obsessed with things in life, that's what worry is. Worry is different than from concern. You should be concerned about life. I'm not negating that. You know what worry is? Calculating without God. Well, I can't give that money to the church. I might need it in my retirement. You don't even know if you're going to see retirement. Uh oh, boy, it's quiet this place today. That means the words flow like crazy. You get it with me. Worry is calculating with God, not taking it into effect, not being aware, not living with a consciousness that the peace of the Father is here. Make me aware of you, Father God. Change my focus from me, myself, and I to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit who has come nigh. Jesus, I'll ask the 
Father, you'll see me the Comforter. God, help us with self-awareness. Well, listen to what Christ's awareness is. We need a little humor. God is good all the time. He put the song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good. That's called, uh, what's the word? Uh, a little bit of humor to lighten the mood because you're real quiet in the day. <laughs> Christ the parents. Whenever anything begins to, to disintegrate your life with Christ, turn to Him at once. Asking him to reestablish your rest. Never allow anything to remain in your life that is causing the unrest, the lack of peace. Think of every detail of your life that is causing the disintegration as something to fight against, not as something you should allow to remain. Ask the Lord to put awareness of himself in you, and your self-awareness will disappear. Awareness, the ability to directly know and perceive, to feel and be cognizant of events, more broadly, the state of being conscious of something, more specifically, the awareness that comes from relationship with Christ through grace and trust that his peace, oh me, the peace is there for the taking. If I will just be more aware of him and what he wants for my life, I'll have that peace. That passes understanding. God, give us awareness of you because we want the peace of the Father. What else today? <laughs> what I just read from Chambers kind of leads to the next part of the message. The second truth. We must be aware of the place the Father has in my life. You know, I went to the race last night over at Bristol. The first the first year I was here, I had someone give me tickets. And I told you I went over there and it rained the whole night and I saw 40 laps and ended up in my car about 11.30 soaking wet and I had to get up and preach the next morning. And I said, I'm not going back to that place. Well, we got four free tickets last year. So me and Cooper went. It got rained a little bit. I saw the race. Had a good time. So this year, the weather was looking good. So, so we went over to the race. I didn't have free tickets this time. I decided I would go and I would find somebody to sell them to me for maybe if I could get them for $40 or $50 ticket, $40 or $50 ticket. That's a lot of money, but uh, the face value is over $100 a lot of them. And so, so I, I went over to the race and, and I, I, Scott, I rode with Scott, I met him at Cracker Barrel, and uh, he parked and we rode together, but they had their tickets and they got settled. And, and me and Cooper were out front there trying to find tickets, waiting as late as we could so we get the best price. 7.15, we get our tickets and win our seats. Early on, my, my guy, my driver, and I, I pull for him because uh, he drives a Ford. Joey Lugano got in some trouble. He was four laps back. And I watched him pulling for him to get those laps back. And then I texted Scott. He was on the other side of the racetrack. I said, look, Lugano's got all four laps back. He's making a move. And I'm thinking, man, I'm hoping he's headed for, for position number one. And next thing I know, he's in another wreck. <laughs> and they bring him into the pits, and they pull out real track and put tinfoil all across the front of it. And we know it's not tinfoil. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I know he's not going to be in the first position. And then I just relegated to pull for any Ford that would win. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm trying to see the Instagram post or Facebook post. I take a picture of me and Cooper at the race with our Ford shirts on. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Cooper nudges me. Look, guy, one lap to go. The Ford didn't win. <laughs> Jenny Hamlin did the wheel. He was in first position. A lot of times, peace eludes us because of the position we're putting the Father. We must be aware 
uh, the position, or in another way, the place he has in our life. Jesus says, seek first. Seek there is a present tense word. I said earlier, the being aware, the ability to, to perceive and be conscious of what's going on, I think every day what we must be aware. Every moment we're talking to God and we're saying, please help me put you in, in first place, in the first position, kingdom and his righteousness. And then Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am a pastor because of the grace of God. He, grace is, yes, it's God's forgiveness and kindness and found in relationship. Grace is also his strength.
Uh oh, Brother Pelton, my new friend. Some of you are saying, I came to church today to get lifted up. I'm not beating us. I'm just saying that we see these things of we see these things as, as bad things. Oh, I better surrender. There's no joy in surrender. Not what we surrender to and who we surrender to. When we say to God, I want your peace to rule in my heart. I don't want to live with a troubled heart. I want to live with my trust and faith daily put in you. And I want to have that peace that others will know there's something in me and about me that they will desire. And I can truly say, peace like a river attendeth my soul. And I really want to live with Jesus and, and the Father in first place. For if he who did not spare his own son that gave him up freely for me, he'll surely give me everything else that fulfills my life. Amen. By the way, that scream ain't because I'm going to scream. That's called passion. Amen. Try some of it. You might like it. God help us today. Amen. God help us. We wonder why our churches are dying. We're playing cautious. There's nothing I read about the gospel of Jesus Christ that says cautious to me. I'm sorry. In my grace, I am this morning I headed to the shower. You know, I went to bed last night at quarter to one. And I told God two things. I need some re I need some good sleep tonight. And you can wake me up whenever you want to. And around five o'clock my eyes popped open. <laughs> well, my alarm's five forty five, so I can get up forty five minutes. <laughs> get up. And I had to get up I didn't have to even roll out of the bed and land on the floor. I pulled my feet up, and God, and I'm like, God, you're giving me strength today. You, you, you answer my prayer. And as I was preparing to get in the shower, I had this wave come through the word of gratitude. God, I'm tired, and Ford didn't win last night. <laughs> but I get to go serve you today. What a privilege. I'm humbled. How I didn't stand. saying that word. Two words, actually. Be aware. It's this idea of awareness. God making us aware of himself, his love and peace and joy, and us perceiving his, his love and living in his love and experiencing his peace and just understanding in our heart of hearts that there's nothing better than the Father. And, 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 and it's being aware, living in awareness of, and, and enjoying his peace and, and understanding his first place in our life. Oh, man, wow, be aware. But then there's a word, beware. It's a little different. 
when you go to somebody's house and they got a mean dog, beware of the dog. In other words, if he gets a hold of you, let's use the East Tennessee phone. He's going to put a hurting on you. <laughs> Hang on to that thought for a minute. Don't come back there. Be aware of the peace of the Father. Be aware of what place he has. And be aware that you keep a perspective of the Father's whom. That place called heaven. My father's house has many rooms. You know, I've heard people who are King James only being one. If you're that, uh, I'm not trying to offend you. I guess I would say it was good enough for Paul. It's good enough for me. I don't think Paul did the 1612, though. <laughs> my father's, in my father's house, so many mansions. It's just rooms here. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking a room in father's house. That would be pretty nice. I can trust you. can trust me to take this tip back. It ain't one till six. <laughs> My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. Talking to Cooper the other day. You know, Satan, he wants to lull us into this idea that this life is all there is to it. He even lulls Christians into that idea. What do you mean? so comfortable in your life on this earth that you're not looking forward to heaven and not looking daily for his return. And I'm not talking about just a second coming. This ain't fear mongering. This could be your last day on earth. Scott was telling me about his brother-in-law's sister. She's like 45, 43. Several years ago, her husband died. She's a widow. He was 37 years old. He died. He was like a, um, um, a medical um, prescription sales person. Died in a hotel. 37 years old. Love, love the Lord. He, these couples of devout followers of Christ. What am I saying? I'm not trying to scare us this to death. Perspective of the Father's heaven and the ultimate reward. Have I arrived yet? No. I haven't. It's obvious I've not arrived in heaven because I'm right here. <laughs> but have I arrived in my life? No. The Lord's constantly having a nudge to remind me. You know, I heard this story one time about these missionaries. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's, 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 it helps us today. And they're coming home after like 40 years on the mission field. Had given their best years, their resources, had, had, had forfeited anything that we as Americans enjoy, had been in Africa somewhere. And they were coming home on a ship. This would have been years ago. And, and they were arriving in the port and they saw all these big welcome signs. And they thought that they were being welcomed home. And they got excited. And then they found out there was a prestigious lawmaker that had been away. Very influential man. And he was being welcomed home. Welcome home, Senator so and so. And they got a little sad. Their spirits dropped, and God whispered to the man and the woman, perhaps simultaneously, What you sad about? You ain't home yet.
be where the peace of the Father, what place you put him in through his son, and the perspective that you live daily with, and I'm part of you, I should say to me. Bruce, would you just play something quietly, if you don't mind? We're going to close now. God was talking to me so clearly this week. ladies are smiling. And I said, let me tell you something about my, about my girl. She's a hard worker. She's loyal. And she's a good kid. And I was so proud to be her dad. Perspective. Peace. First place to God. The will. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, Father. Down. We're 
we're going to have the time and just respond. You know, I had another dear person in the Lord who said to me, don't ever quit giving people a chance to respond. And so I, I have to claim to do that anyway, and that person knows that they are. Where are you today? How's your peace with the Father? What place is He really in? And what's your true perspective? 